Dr. and Rabbi Marvin Stewart Antelman was a religious Zionist. He was born in 1933 and he passed away in 2013 at the age of 80. His wife, Joyce, passed away four years prior to Dr. Antelman. He was born in America and he lived in Newton, Massachusetts before he moved to Israel. Professionally, he was an American-Israeli chemist holding roughly 15 patents in chemistry and medicine, one of which claimed to be an injectable cure for HIV. It was patent 5676977 Tetracil. I don't know anything about it. It's just one of the claim one of the patents that he had claimed. Uh, Dr. Antelman was also an author, and perhaps his best-known works include thermoplastics and electrode potentials. He wrote the Analytical Encyclopedia of Thermoplastic Materials, as well as the Encyclopedia of Chemical Electrode Potentials. And of course, he wrote this book and its successor, Volume 2. It's important to note that Rabbi Antelman also noted himself as a traditionalist, and According to one New York Times article, November 25th, 1982, written by Joanne Omang, Antelman practiced some older traditions that were not really found prevalent by the modern Jewish society. For example, in Omang's opening to her story, she writes, quote, Snuffing candles and solemnly blowing a ram's horn in a room at a holiday inn in Massachusetts, Three rabbis used a text dating from the 1750s to excommunicate several hundred Jews last weekend for alleged Marxist views on Israel and sex, end quote. So basically, this story was in regard to Antelman and two of his colleagues who were trying to excommunicate some American Jews, and Antelman formed this so-called court in 1973, naming himself as the Chief Justice. It had 13 members, and it was called the Supreme Rabbinical Court of America Incorporated. According to the courts, it really held no merit um, because the rulings couldn't be overturned unless it was done so by Israeli chiefs of the Ashkenazi or Shepardic communities. So, of course, nobody was ever excommunicated. But aside from all the subterfuge or all of this play acting, it really lent to the accusation of sort of a mutiny from this traditional doctrine. So anyway, Marvin Antelman was known as a Dayan, a D-A-Y-A-N. And this is kind of sketchy to me because if you look at good old Wikipedia, which I know it's not a viable source and it's vague at best, Wikipedia summarizes Antelman's bio that a Dayan is simply a Judaic judge. Okay, that's simple enough, right? But you guys, if you look up other uh, other definitions of what a Dayan is, it is a witch. It is one who practices black magic witchcraft. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's something like the Black Pope. Honestly, I don't have enough information about the ideological platform of his faith or his sector, but that's just what his bio says. He was a Dayan as well. So I never knew him, but I can imagine that someone who had 15 patents in scientific fields and medicine, he was a very self-assured man, to say the least. But I think it's important for you to understand his background as we go further, because even though I don't uphold a Jewish ideology and I really had opposing worldviews before reading this book, after I read this book, it only lends merit further to the fact that everything we are being told is a narrative. We have an overall agenda being set forth on us for this grand scheme of things wreaking havoc in all aspects of human life. Literally, every single aspect of human life is in turmoil right now. But I also want you to know that Dr. Antelman called Bohemian Grove as it was. Quote, satanic pedophilic organization full of bohemian oligarchs, end quote. So it's also important to note that some of these bigwigs here that we're going to talk about momentarily, um, even Jacob Frank pimped his wife out to recruit new members. And why shopped? Uh, I believe he got his sister pregnant. So talking about loose morals is something we're also going to review in this book. But my other point is that this entire chaotic orchestration of secrecy and conspiracy and control and power and debauchery. It's all part of this theological platform. So whether you believe or not, you're still directly affected because 
the people who are in control do believe. And they are shifting the narrative to fit this belief structure. So one of the things, you know, I, I did a video on the Constitution. I have since privatized that because I don't feel that I got my point across to demonstrate the negative aspects of what happened in 1776 and prior. And I also don't believe that I set an accurate depiction or created the full narrative of Lincoln because Lincoln has a lot of negative associations with him as well. And really only 50% of the nation voted for him. So a nation divided does fall, but we started out as a divided nation and look at where we are today, we are still divided. And part of that bigger narrative is trying to get the American people to believe that it is me against you, when in actuality, it is us collectively against them. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's get into To Eliminate the Opiate, Volume 1 by Rabbi Marvin Antelman, written in 1974 and published by Zahavia Limited. 249 South Lafayette Park Place, Los Angeles, California, 90057. Now, Marx himself was not the founder or the fabricator of the League or the Communist Party. Rather, Marx and co-author Frederick Engels were hired by the League for their writing services. And this should be known as an argument for race war and segregation, really. If you go read the motives, it's really sad what people support and they don't know the underpinnings or immorally outdated foundations that these ideologies stand on. But this platform is an outdated one and it focuses on the zeitgeist of the time. And we've both advanced and declined since then, but we'll discuss Marx more in later chapters. Antelman continues by stating that the foundations of the communist platform model Plato's Republic. In chapter one, part one, volume one, Antelman discusses, this is entitled to eliminate the opiate, but Antelman discusses that contrary to popular opinion, Karl Marx did not originate this communist manifesto. He was paid by the League for his services and... This, at the time, was a secret society that later became known as the International Communist Party. The actual origin of the Bund, or the League, seems to be lost in obscurity, but it is believed by many political scientists to have been influenced largely by another secret organization, the Illuminati, which was the brainchild of a Bavarian intellectual named Adam Weishaupt, who is believed to have been an ex-Jesuit. The Illuminati was founded on May 1st, 1776, and it is for this reason that many scholars believe that May Day has achieved prominent status in Marxist, Leninist organizations, and other socialist communist coalition groups throughout the world. When Weishaupt first conceived uh, the notion of the new social order, he was basically guided by the model of the Republic of Plato, which 428 to 347 BCE. This would have made it thousands of years outdated already. But Weishaupt was professor of canon law in Bavaria, and the Illuminati was known in Germany uh, to have this parallel with Plato's Republic. Just as Plato provided for three classes of people in his Republic, so too did the Illuminati. In its highest class, they had the mystery class, which was comprised of grades of memberships consisting of priests, regents, maguses, kings. And one thing is certain, when Weishaupt died in 1830, the roots of the Communist Party were very well established. The party was secretly dominated by some of the most prominent men in German society, and its most influential chapters extended into France and Belgium, and later worldwide. To understand communism, it is well to study Plato's Republic. Plato's three classes consist of ruling, working, and military. Plato called for the complete elimination of marriage and family so that all women would belong to all men, and all men would belong to all women. Children born from promiscuous unions would be raised anonymously by the state. The state would eliminate all defectives. So if your child had a birth defect, it would be killed. And you wouldn't even know because it would be taken away for the state to raise. Actually, Plato's Republic is nothing more than a crystallization of the worst aspects of Hellenism. Judaism has victoriously fought Hellenism in a life and death struggle within 200 years of Plato's death. 
It was in the battles of the Maccabees that Jews fought for their convictions of basic morality as well as for their freedom of religion. In the modern Communist Party, the three classes still exist. However, the general public tends to think of communism as an order catering to the working classes, and they do not realize the very powerful wealthy men living in free societies of the world today are its kings and priests. They secretly manipulate and control most communist governments uh, and Marxist-Leninist activities throughout the world. These powerful people conceive of themselves as masterminds and rulers of the new world order, which they believe will eventually secede and supersede all governments. A monument existing in the free world erected to this concept exists in the lobby of Harry S. Truman Peace Institute of the Hebrew University on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. It is here in the lobby that a mysterious painting hangs which stumps spectators, and from which three strands of what appears to be hair emanate from an illuminating background and unite to form one bond. This represents the three classes. If one goes out to the front of the building, one will find inscribed on the monument prominent names that have been linked throughout a work written by a prominent leftist intellectual historian, Carol Quigley. It is in Quigley's thesis that he should reveal the names of the inner communist circle today, for which he was seriously condemned by them, because Quigley felt that the communist revolution had come so far that even the revelation of its secret leaders would have no harm or on its aims and purposes. This abandoned peace institute in Jerusalem is a manifestation of the highest so-called Jewish echelons of the world communism. What we shall demonstrate is that these born Jews and their predecessors have attempted to destroy the basic universal morality which Judaism holds sacred as well as the religious practices. It was these antecedents who laid a vicious foundation to annihilate Judaism and are continuing the process today. Chapter 2, Part 1, Volume 1, entitled The New Order. Anselman further discusses the political radicalism of Plato's Republic and what it means to eliminate the opiate. So exactly what is behind this call for an uprising? So again, Anselman opens the chapter with two quotes. The first is from Proverbs and it states, We shall find all precious wealth. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us have one purse. And that's Proverbs chapter 1 verse 13 and 14. And he follows this quote by one from Plato's Republic, chapter 6, page 494. And what will a man such as he is be likely to do under such circumstances, especially if he be a citizen of a great city, rich and noble, and of tall, proper youth? Will he not be full of pointless aspirations and fancy himself able to manage the affairs of the Hellenes or of barbarians? And having got such notions in his head, Will he not delate and elevate himself in the fullness of vain pomp and senseless pride? So again, following the political radicalism of Plato, the new order, the new social order schemed by masterminds, could only be realized by three types of revolution, economic, political, and religious. So it was that all the clandestine meetings of the Bund der Gretchen, or the League of the Just, which took place in the early part of the 19th century, that schemes were effectuated for economic, political, and religious revolutions. It was Karl Marx who was only expressing and articulating communism's Hellenistic ideology when he said that religion is the opiate of the people. The world has seen and has come to appreciate what political and economic revolution entails as in the Bolshevik Revolution, the People's Republic of China, Castro's Cuba, and the Allende's Marxist confiscation of industry by the state of Chile. The world, however, is not too familiar with the religious revolution, and this has been mostly carefully guarded by the communist hierarchy. It is among our objectives to focus on the religious revolution, and especially the aspects of this religious revolution which regard Judaism. So the original inner circle of the Bund der Gretchen consisted of born Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, and those representatives and respective subdivisions formulated schemes for the ultimate destruction of their faiths, which is just sad. 
the heretical Catholics laid plans, which they felt could take a century or more for the ultimate destruction of the church, the apostate Jews for the ultimate destruction of the Jewish religion. And since the Jewish religion was the mother of the two great Western religions, Christianity and the Muslim faith, Judaism naturally became a primary target. The brilliant communist leaders knew and perceived that it was Judaism that still infused and permeated a spirituality into those other religions, even though the religion was despised by many of the leaders of the daughter religions. So it should not seem strange that compulsive hatred for the Jewish religion was manifested throughout the rise of world communism. It was Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883, who was born Jewish and whose family converted to Christianity when he was six. He wrote a book, A World Without Jews, and Karl Marx helped promote anti-Semitism in the United States. In his reports from Europe for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune, Marx wrote, Thus we find every tyrant backed by a Jew. In 1856, Karl Marx wrote, Thus do these loans, which are a curse to the people, a ruin to the government, become a blessing to the house of Judah. This Jewish organization of loan mongers is as dangerous to the people as the aristocratic organization of landowners, end quote. Congressman Gordon Scherer of the House Committee on Un-American Activities was convinced from the testimony of many people, including prominent Jews, that the committee party was anti-Semitic and is as anti-Semitic as Hitler ever was. Communism was, of course, committed to atheism and Judaism was inexorably committed to monotheism, the root of all religious beliefs in the Western world today. It is also interesting to note that Hitler was in fact a national socialist in contradistinction to the communist who was an international socialist. Ideologically, the two platforms are identical, except that the, the Nazi fascist kind of dictatorship, it could care less about the international socialist. Its own Germany or Deutschland über alles, which is Germany above all, prevailing its thought and action. It was Hitler's political platform that appealed to the German working classes that spoke of socializing industry and retail business, but nevertheless, it was backed by big wealthy industrialists such as Krupp. In addition to the conscious and subconscious hatred of the Jew for his religious beliefs of practices, the Jew is also despised for his entrepreneurship and rugged individualism. This hatred for rugged individualism is not necessarily confined to the Jews, for Stalin exterminated several million kulaks who professed a unique rugged individualism, which was manifested in a closely knit agrarian subculture within the Soviet Union. Also, the religious Jewish individual tenaciously clings to the concepts and practices which reflect the sanctity of human life. In the communist state, the state is supreme and the importance of family and property rights and even human life are subservient to the state. Thus, the concept of divine presence in man, which reflects itself in the behavior and patterns of the religious Jew, was considered a threat to the state because next to these values, the state appeared in sharp contrast as being demeaning or barbaric. From the time of Abraham, Jews were committed to preserve what was known as the Seven Commandments of the Sons of Noah. We know them as the Noahide Laws, which include prohibitions against homicide, including abortion and euthanasia, incestuous sexual relations, theft, blasphemy, idolatry, and demands that the government produce such laws like capital punishment, and Basically, laws in Hebrew are called dinim, D-I-N-I-M, and they're so linked with government that the Hebrew word for government is Medina, M-E-D-I-N-A, which literally means derived from law. The antithesis of all of this is the atheistic communist state, which murders and curtails free religious expression among its citizens. It encourages sexual depravity and immorality in society. There's really not one single communist government in the world where religion can be practiced freely without interference. And this is a consequence of believing that religion is the opiate of the people 
which, according to Marx's manifesto, logically calls for the elimination thereof. Okay, so remember the Bund Gerichten. Bund means league or group, and Gericht is just or fair. So the League of the Just. We spoke of the formative days of the League when it set out its aims and purposes and its particular goal of destroying religion. It might be difficult to conceive of how a professed Jew or Catholic would seek to destroy their own religion. However, one should consider that the Bund's inner circle really consisted of unusually gifted intellectuals who were members of a specific religion by birth only, and super wealthy individuals whose boundless ambitions for power had caused them to become unscrupulous. Their lust for power was of such great dimensions that it could cause any loyalties that they may have harbored to their own religious orders to become ancillary to the objectives of the League. It suited these people, both socially and by temperament, to retain a facade of religious formality which did not prevent them from going about their demonic business of destroying religion methodically. Catholic traitors among them playing out their roles in undermining the authority of the church and its ultimate destruction, and turncoat Jews among them going about their assigned tasks of undermining and destroying the authority of Judaism. The masterminds of the Bund, as was mentioned before, were a handful of super rich, but it is indeed bitterly ironic that the concept of a world conspiracy has been abused by anti-Semitic propaganda, as is in the infamous Protocols of the Elders of Zion, claiming that international Jews seek world domination. The best references to these masterminds is Quigley's book, which he published in 1966, entitled Tragedy and Hope. And we've actually discussed this in The Architects of the New World Order. In choosing the title of his book, Quigley considered those who oppose the communist revolution as the tragedy. Tragedy because those people are doomed. The hope was designated for those who are committed to the world of communism. And Quigley believes that the little people cannot turn back the tide of the revolution and also believes that it is high time that the great men were acknowledged for their accomplishments. So what makes... Quigley quite credible here is that he is indeed a leftist. Now, among the leaders of the world communism acclaimed by Quigley are the Rockefellers and Morgans, as well as those Jews who are of special interest to us here. The Schiffs, Warburgs, and most of the Rothschilds. Now, remember, the Schiffs grew up in the house of the Rothschild, and Jacob Schiff's father, um, he was actually the investor or the banker for the Rothschilds. Now, Jacob Schiff also is credited with giving $20 million to the Bolshevik Revolution. A year after his death, the Bolsheviks deposited over 600 million rubies to Schiff's banking firm, Kuhn and Loeb. It was Jacob Schiff and his family who played a prominent role in developing the reform and conservative apostate Jewish movements and who aided them at critical stages of their development in putting into action the demonic master plan to undermine all world religions. Fragmentation and divide and conquer tactics were the order of the day. Now, if Jews could be fragmentized and irreversibly split, success in implementing the religious revolution would be achieved. They conceived the idea by developing their own network of rabbinical seminaries to ordain their own fraudulent rabbis. The pretentiousness of this scheme was unbelievable. However, with the power that these super rich held and their ability to apply it to all levels of German society from the media to the political arena, its success was guaranteed in Germany. Abraham Geiger, May 24th, 1810 to October 23rd, 1874, was the man that the League chose to be their primary personality to implement the reform movement. Geiger was a graduate of Bonn and Heidelberg. On November 21st, 1832, he became rabbi in Wiesbaden. On May 6th, 1833, he was engaged to be married to Emily Oppenheim. The wedding took place on July 1st, 1840. They were deeply in love then and all their married life, despite the fact that their marriage was con- Saved under sinister circumstances. One may ask why Geiger was engaged to Emily for as long of a period as seven years, and the answer is that Oppenheim-Geiger marriage was contrived by the super-rich. Emily was the granddaughter of Gumpel Oppenheim, 
who was in the inner circle of the League, and the sister of Heinrich Bernard Oppenheim, 1819 to 1880. It was this Oppenheim who was one of the masterminds of the 1848 Communist Revolution in Germany. Geiger was on trial. He was given seven years to formulate an effective theology on Reform Judaism. He did his work well, and before he got married, he had succeeded in founding a radical society for Jewish theology in Germany, as well as setting up a dynamic organizational structure for Reform Judaism in 1835 and convening the first formalized conference of Reform rabbis in 1837. Due largely to Geiger, the Reform movement became, by 1850, the dominant Jewish schism in Germany. Having become a smashing success, he captured the loyalty of the majority of Jews born there, although the status of such Jews from God's Torah perspective was now in danger. Since Geiger continued to perform so well, he was rewarded again by having a marriage arranged between his nephew and a Schiff girl. Before... Uh, the communist revolution in 1848 in Germany, the Jewish directed activities of the league began to be more pronounced and more complex. The new reform movement was attracting new converts daily. The calculating callousness of the league for human beings and human emotions was further manifested by the way thousands of lives were manipulated. People who were largely attracted to the reform accepted the movement at face value of what they considered to be an intrinsic worth of merits. Little did they realize that their acceptance of this heresy would cause the descendants to be totally lost to Judaism. Little did they also realize was that they were being played for fools and that lives were being toyed with and used by power-hungry men on the altars of ambition, success, and politics. The League conceived of the ultimate plans for the secularization and destruction of Judaism. If the movements which they set up were sincerely interested in preserving Judaism and acting as stopgaps as they claimed, they would have long ago funneled and educated the masses with their vast resources into a religious way of life in which the Torah is the central authority and the binding law. All right, you're going to have to bear with me in chapter four because it is entitled The Birth of the Orthodox N-Word. And I will be replacing the word with expletive because it's not a part of my vocabulary. And I'll I'll be replacing it out of respect. Um, But the author is using it here in a context to demonstrate how Karl Marx and the League threw the word around in daily conversation as a derogatory term. So out of my own respect, I will not use it. I will be replacing it with expletive. So chapter four, birth of the orthodox expletive. A characteristic of the divide and conquer psychology of the communist movement has been its ability to instigate divisiveness among groups. Over the years, it has formed revolution by accentuating differences between blacks and whites, Asiatics and Occidentals, so that's Europeans, youth and elders, landlords and tenants, Christians and Jews, Muslims and Christians, and with the advent of women's lib, even between men and women and a husband and wife. One tactic that the reform movement desired to implement was to divide Jews. Thus, the authentic Jew who had practiced his Judaism over the centuries, despite minor differences to outer forms of worship or local customs as differentiates Shepardic Spanish-Portuguese elements from the Ashkenazic and Jasidic communities was now destined to be relegated to the role of member of a reactionary sect called Orthodoxy. The term Orthodox was to be used as a bigoted, derogatory term in the same manner that a white bigot would employ the term expletive. This was in the best tradition of Marx and his boomed sponsors, It should be noted that Marx himself used the term expletive to indeed degrade all Jews when he published another one of his anti-Semitic diatribes entitled The Jewish Expletive. Accordingly, the term orthodox came to be utilized in common parlance as synonymous with a backwards, non-progressive, and unsophisticated and reactionary Jew. 
Geiger was not alone in setting up so-called enlightenment scholarly circles. A scheme was developed in these circles to talk up the branch concept through a nucleus of scholars. A rationale and an impetus were developed for the acceptance of a branch concept in Judaism. So the, the impetus is actually the driving force behind the rationale, which creates the movement. Now, Judaism, which has not had branches, was to be praised for its diversity. Anyone who spoke of a unified or united Judaism was to be sneered at as an ignoramus who failed to recognize that Judaism is not monolithic. We will find later how Geiger himself was to be crucified by this concept when the Bund designed in 1854 to create a conservative movement among Jews. Geiger sought to resurrect the conflict of the Sadducees and Pharisees through his scholarly studies of the historical period. His studies were first rate, but through them he wanted to plant the idea very subtly in people's minds that branch and schism were not new to Judaism. In academic circles, his masterful studies were accepted with acclaim. When filtered down to the masses, his studies and those of his contemporaries translated into a glib justification for the so-called branches of Judaism. Geiger and his colleagues were, of course, notoriously intellectually dishonest. What they failed to tell the masses was that although there had existed before in Jewish history such diverse groups as the Sadducees, Pharisees, Rabbinites, and Karaites, that Judaism had survived via the Pharisees and Rabbinites, and that even their opponents never dared question the basic validity of the concept of Torah min hashamim, and that the Torah was a divinely revealed document. Both Sadducee and Karite had challenged the derivation of specific laws in Judaism. Their dissension, though intolerable to Judaism and Torah values, questioned fundamental interpretation of the Torah, but never cast doubts on its divinely revealed origin. These schisms were not branches of Judaism. Both so-called Reform and Conservative Judaism are not branches of Judaism, but stand outside its pale because both hold that God did not write the Torah, but rather that men created it. Conservatives differed with Reform insofar that since Reform had accepted the notion that the Torah was man-made and it could reject all of Torah law with impunity, only retaining the universal values of Judaism, the conservatives felt that much of the ceremonial, ritual, and halakhic norms of Judaism should be conserved, not because the Torah was divinely revealed, but because those things were culturally important and gave Judaism a national character. Judaism could never tolerate even lesser dissensions on the scale of the Karaites and Sadducees, and could never make peace with these movements. The process of going from authentic Judaism to the stage of complete rejection of the divine origin of the Torah was not instantaneous. The first reform service in 1807, conducted by Illuminati Bundist Israel Jacobson, introduced one slight change into the ritual. It had translated the Yikim Perkan prayer of the Sabbath Musaf service from Aramaic to German. Reform gradually introduced other deviations, such as instrumental music on July 17, 1810, into the service. However, as late as the 1930s, German reform had never psychologically accepted the mixing of the sexes in the worship. Men and women continued to have separate sections in European reform temples, though they blasphemously believed that men, not God, composed the Torah, but even this radical idea was not a sudden one. It was predicated on basic policies that seemed to be initially innocuous, as well as the Declaration of Principles in 1843 of the Verein der Reform Freund of Frankfurt, or Frankfurt's Reform Society. The principles read as follows, and there's two here. So one is we recognize the possibility of unlimited development in the Mosaic religion, and two, the collection of controversies, dissertations, and prescriptions commonly designated by the name Talmud possesses for us no authority for either dogmatic or religious considerations. The initial thrust was philosophically choreic, 
an attack on the Talmud. The intermediate stage was complete apostasy and attack on the Torah. However, the final state is even worse because although the original reformers embraced universal ethics of the Noahide laws, it has followers today who are now calling for abolition of capital punishment in our society, who endorse abortion, who seek to justify tolerance of criminal elements, who uphold illicit sexual relations, and who have incorporated these congregations within their structures. They even praise atheistic rabbis. And in their scheme, after the fashion of reformed clergymen Klausner and Eisendroth, have even found room for Jesus in the Jewish scheme of things. Which I think is a really odd thing to say, but in closing of chapter four, I want to clarify some things before we get into chapter five. So first of all, a Rebbe is a spiritual leader. So according to Google, a Rebbe is a teacher of the Torah and like an elementary student studying Hebrew and Judaism, they're called a cheder, C-H-E-D-E-R, and they would address their spiritual teacher as Rebbe. It's a Yiddish German equivalent to the Hebrew word rabbi. So a Rebbe is a rabbi. Now the term Lubavitcher came from the town of Lubavitch, Poland where in the 17th century this movement started. So the Lubavitcher Hasad was the spiritual movement of the Jews, and that Hasidic movement taught that when every Jew was practicing and following the Torah, God would return. So the Lubavitcher Hasidic Rebbe at the time in the 17th century, 1789 to 1866, was Menachem Mendelssohn Schneerson. He was the Zemak Zedek, which means righteous scion or <laughs> righteous sprout, that's the translation. I'm not making it up. So this righteous sprout, the Zemak Zedek, uh, he w was himself believed by many to be the Messiah, but he didn't meet the biblical qualifications for it. For example, the book of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7, as well as Psalms 132 and Genesis 49 10, all state that the Messiah must be from the line of David. So here we're presented with bloodlines and Schneerson was not. And again, in Micah 5, 2, it states that the Messiah must be born in Bethlehem, and Schneerson was not. Also, Isaiah 5, 3 states that the Messiah must live a sinless life, die for his people, and rise from the dead. And again, Schneerson did not. So with all of this being said, the Zemak Zedek and the Haskalah movements are brought up here in chapter 5. And this is entitled, The League's Ill-Fated Russian Campaign. Once Abraham Geiger had succeeded in forming basic organizational structures, reform was now ready for expansion in other areas. The League decided to export its heresies to Russia and decided that Max Lilienthal, 1814 to 1882, was the right man for the job. Dr. Lilienthal was partially successful. In 1840, he succeeded in opening a Jewish school where he could implant the seeds of destruction against Judaism. In December 1841, he laid the groundwork to government-sponsored Jewish secular schools in Russia. However, Lilienthal was not successful because he had never reckoned with the power of the great Lubavitcher Hasidic rabbi who lived at the time in Russia called the Zemak Zedek. It was he who completely dissipated these efforts and taught the communists a lesson that they never forgot, so much so that generations later, after the revolution, they imprisoned this man's descendant, known as the Lubavitcher Rebbe in Russia, and they threatened to kill him and throw him down a flight of stairs. So an excellent account of the 19th century events is to be found in the Zemak Zedek and the Haskalah movements, from which we have profusely drawn. It was furthermore this stunning defeat that heightened extreme disdain for Russian Jews when it was manifested in many ways by Jacob Schiff. In 1838, Dr. Lilienthal came to Raja, which is the capital of uh, yeah. Latvia, which is on the border of Russia. And he came to assume the leadership of a special school designed to destroy Judaism, which opened its doors in January of 1840. The Bund exercised the master plan through a committee consisting of the reform functionaries Philipson, Hohenberg, Mannheimer, and Auerbach. Lilienthal was born in Munich and graduated from the University of Munich. To get an idea of how ruthless the committee was, let's examine just one member, Homburg. 
Now, he attempted to have a tax imposed in Germany in 1795 on the Sabbath and holiday candles used by Jews. And he was a man of very rotten moral character. He was convicted of misappropriating funds in 1801. And in 1810, he published a booklet entitled Who is Culturally Fit for Marriage, in which he tried to discredit righteous Jews as not being fit for marriage. From 1814 to 1841, Hamburg served under Franz I as inspector of Jewish schools in Bohemia, where he succeeded in destroying the Jewish parochial school system. When Lilienthal arrived in Riga, much of the groundwork had already been laid by the League-controlled agents in Russia. Lilienthal integrated himself with the then Prince Lichtenberg of Russia, who was the prominent son-in-law of the anti-Semitic Tsar Nicholas I who was notorious for his compulsory conscription of Jewish children into the Russian army and attempts for their forced conversion to Christianity. Prince Lichtenberg could be considered an initial forerunner in the intrigues of government preceding the Bolshevik Revolution. He was a free thinker, considered a heretic by the Vatican, and was cause for the King of Bavaria to be censured by them for not concerning himself with his younger brother's conduct. By marriage, he became the Tsar's son-in-law, whose fondness for him turned into embitterment when he learned of Lichtenberg's atheism. Accordingly, Count Bidlov, head of the third section of the Tsar's secret police, kept him under constant surveillance. Lilienthal arrived with a letter of introduction from the King of Bavaria. The League held strong sway over the King of Bavaria, and Lilienthal's influence in Russia was to be well established because of these ties. However, because of Lichtenberg's surveillance by the secret police, Lilienthal was destined to be a suspect for police subversion. Not only did the secret police have their eyes on Lilienthal, but unknown to him, all of his movements were carefully watched by the Zemak Zedek, whose intelligence network was so thorough and complete that it could easily compete with our own CIA or FBI. Lilienthal presented a plan which originated from the League and it was a front. It was entitled Enlightenment Society in Germany, and it had been a keen sense of importance of media, education, and religious dissemination. The plan, which he submitted, called for closing public housing, destroying all existing harmful literature, and establishing schools to teach the Russian language and making attendance mandatory for Jews. He also began to engage himself in malice and character assassination and decided to use his influence to undermine the rabbis and especially the Zemak Zedek. Thus, Lilienthal asserted that the Zemak Zedek was a persecutor of culture and accused him of sending special emissaries to prevent Jewish youths from fulfilling their duties as citizens in serving in the military and publishing and distributing Hasidic books that are rife for his teachings of separatism. Dr. Lilienthal and his cohorts in Russia made concerted attacks against the Torah and Judaism. Agents of the society were dispatched to spy on the Zemak Zedek. They also instigated the writing of scores of denunciatory letters, which arrived daily to the Minister of Interior, Culture of the Secret Police, which spoke against Jewish religious leaders and key merchants, villagers and innkeepers whose morals or integrity they could not compromise. These letters charged rebellion, contempt for Christianity, misappropriation of taxes, violation of the restricted areas which only Jews may inhabit, smuggling, bribery, and usury. On one occasion, Lilienthal attempted to impress Count Uvarov, the minister of culture. He stated that the rabbis condone all sorts of unethical iniquities with Gentiles, including usury and misrepresentation. In addition, he accused the rabbis of preaching a policy of separatism from the good Gentile neighbors, and he claimed that the most notorious defender was the saintly Zemach Zedek. Now, Lilienthal continued to gather support and enlist people who were either dedicated to the communist ideal or who had been swayed by this nihilistic rhetoric. One such person that influenced, um, who was such a highly intellectual reputation, was M.A. Gunsberg. Now, unfortunately for Lilienthal, Gunsberg was an intellectually honest person, and he undertook a six-month journey to study the Hasidic Jews in their own communities. So he did kind of a qualitative research study. And 
As a result of his investigation, he was convinced that the rabbis were men of fine character and unusual intellect. He also noted that the laymen were mostly merchants and artisans, and they crowded in the synagogues three times a day and all studied the Torah, Mishnah Talmud, and Jewish law on their own level. He found piety and virtue manifested everywhere that he went. He came to the conclusion that the respect and awe of the rabbi are rooted in the depths of their souls. At a special meeting of Maskalim, or Seekers of Enlightenment, of the Vilna chapter, Dr. Lilenthal was expecting great things, but when he called upon Gunsberg, the secretary of the Lithuanian Maskalim, to give his report on the Hasidim, he was quite depressed. Gunsberg, during his trips, had come to the conclusion that the German mentors were full of misinformation, both on the numerical strength of the Hasidim, which comprised three quarters of the Jewish people in Russia, and quantitatively, particularly the influence of the Zimak Zedek and his colleagues. During the meeting, Dr. Lilenthal laid out plans to bring in 250 quote-unquote qualified teachers trained and licensed by the Germans to staff his new schools. He also outlined plans to sabotage the Zimak Zedek, which included accusing him with collecting funds for a foreign power. Turkey for the purpose of the rebellion, since the Turks were in charge of Israel and the rabbi was constantly sending funds there to support his charitable institutions. All the years that Lilenthal was in Russia, pressure from above, the government, and pressure from below through his educators and Enlightenment societies continued to be applied to the Jewish communities to assimilate. In 1844, the Tsar had honored Lilenthal with a certificate of honorary citizenship. Lilenthal even succeeded in opening a phony rabbinical seminary in Vilna, which was dedicated in 1847 after Lilenthal left Russia. All during this period, the Tsar was applying further pressure of assimilating Jews with his forced conscription law so that during 1842 to 1843, 22,000 Jews had been converted to Christianity, and between 1846 to 1854, 7,000 were baptized. However, things got worse, and they finally came to a head. On May 6, 1843, the first meeting of a government commission aimed at finalizing Jewish assimilation was convened. The Zimak Zedek stood strongly in opposition in what the conspirators wanted to do. The gauntlet was thrown on the table when he stated that if it was the government intention and that of the Muscolum to carry out their plan, that he and his colleagues were prepared to suffer death rather than to transgress. Yuvarov, who was chairman of the commission, placed the rabbi under house arrest and threatened him with a harsh punishment for contempt. During the period of the commission of 1843, which lasted May 6th to August 27th, the Zimak Zedek was under house arrest no less than 22 times for periods of one, two, or three days, which added to the duration of the commission. Seeing that it was impossible to bamboozle the Jewish leadership, Lilenthal suffered the worst defeat of his career in Russia. As these events were unfolding, Lilenthal's name had already become a household name for atheists. After atheist, he had become known as the filthy German apostate in religious circles throughout Russia. Lilenthal's name was one of derision. He had he was hated by the masses. When Lilenthal realized that his time was up on the day that the Zimak Zedek stood up so strongly against him, he sent a letter immediately to Abraham Geiger in Germany, invoking him to come to Russia to save the ship from sinking. Lilenthal had already made arrangements with Yuvarov to have Geiger assume a prestigious position.